The question, is it cool to be clean? We'll find out this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. You know, I got to admit, I'm a little concerned about this week's program. I'll tell you why. Each week, we try and bring you entertaining and informative stories. And you know, in the automotive world, it's not hard to figure out what is popular with everybody gas guzzling sport utilities, luxury sports sedans with 300 horsepower and up and so on. But therein lies my dilemma. You see, our first story is about the Ballard fuel cell. You know, the one that powers that electrical motor that gives off nothing but water vapor out of the exhaust pipe? Great for the environment, but not very interesting for you, especially if you've got an Expedition or a Porsche in the driveway. But nonetheless, this company, Ballard, has been around for 17 years and they've never made a dime of profit. Yet companies like Ford and Daimler Chrysler continue to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into Ballard. So, do they know something we don't know? Well, we're here in Vancouver, home of Ballard, to try and find out. Today represents a historic milestone, not just for the fuel cell industry, not just for the auto industry or the fuel industry, but I believe a milestone for our quality of life. Security is usually tight at the Ballard head office in Vancouver, but the doors were thrown wide open when the company's two largest investors wanted to demonstrate their new vehicles powered by the Ballard fuel cell. The Neckar 4 is Daimler Chrysler's latest fuel cell creation and is based on the Mercedes A-Class subcompact and the Ford P2000 similar in size to a Ford Contour. Today represents the achievement of a major milestone because today we have passenger vehicles which have fuel cells powering the wheels, but that do not take away any of the passenger space or any of the luggage space. And the performance is equivalent to an internal combustion engine vehicle. The pre-2000 that we have here today is powered by a 75 kilowatt, roughly 90 horsepower uh, fuel cell engine, and that is fueled by compressed hydrogen gas. Uh, you might say 75 kilowatts or 90 horsepower doesn't feel like a lot of power, but in electric vehicles, it's the torque that comes at very low RPM from the electric motors. So this 75 kilowatt vehicle uh, can carry five passengers, and this particular one has a range of about 200 kilometers. The other vehicle that uh, we have is the Mercedes uh, A-Class, which we call the Neckar 4, which is because it's the fourth generation of the Mercedes vehicles and it has in it a 50 kilowatt uh, fuel cell system and this one is fueled with liquid hydrogen and it has a range of 480 kilometers and a top speed of about 90 miles an hour. A fuel cell makes electricity. It's not like a battery which stores electricity that you make elsewhere. A fuel cell makes electricity on demand. A PEM or proton exchange membrane fuel cell is made of two plates sandwiched together with a plastic membrane, coated with catalyst. Hydrogen from methanol, natural gas, or petroleum, and oxygen from air are fed through channels in the plates. Hydrogen on one side, oxygen on the other. The hydrogen and oxygen want to be together. The shortest way is through the membrane. But only part of the hydrogen atom, the proton, can pass through the membrane. The electron has to take the long way around through an external circuit, creating useful electricity. The oxygen side attracts the protons and the electrons that have traveled through the external circuit, generating the byproducts of water and heat. By combining single cells, you make a fuel cell stack to produce the required amount of power. Today it's pie in the sky, I suppose, but um, uh, a number of car manufacturers have made commitments uh, to have vehicles on the road by, I think, the year 2004, a good half dozen companies. 
and uh, these people at Ballard say that they're going to be ready for them. Uh, the big obstacle, of course, is price, range, and fitting them into a small vehicle. They've proven they can do that. It's now a matter, I think, of refinement and making the package uh, more affordable. But it's on its way. Uh, I think absolutely. Yeah, this is the P2000, and uh, the first thing you notice maybe is the sound. It's kind of noisy. Uh, I thought it would be much more silence inside this car. And, uh, but on the other end, Ford built this car to be really, really light. So there's no uh, material in this car that is really uh, cutting the sound. What you are hearing first and foremost is the uh, super uh, charger bringing the air inside the car. So if I'm accelerating like this, you can hear that high pitch sound. And I hope that Ford will be able to eliminate that sound without cutting in the advantage of being with driving a fuel cell car. In the year 2004, 10% of the vehicles that are being sold have to be zero emission vehicles. So to do business in California, you have to be able to sell 10% of the products you sell as a zero emission vehicle. So there's pressure to get these vehicles into the showrooms? Yes, there is. Um, we don't like to think that that's the only way they're going to be sold. We, we are, our goal is to make an affordably priced, attractive vehicle that people will want to buy, that it's a great alternative. When we see those two vehicles by uh, Ford and Daimler Chrysler, uh, on the road today, I know that the developments are going forward. Also the infrastructure is a concern at this moment, but everything seems viable. So uh, it's a matter of time, in my opinion, until these things come to fruition and that these kinds of vehicles will be available to the consumer, to the benefit of all. A lot of people have a great deal of expectations of us. Uh, our shareholders have expectations, our partners have expectations, and we have expectations of ourselves that cause us to be driven to have the fuel cell ready in time. And we have demonstrated not only the performance, but also the advancements of the fuel cells to a point where the world can see that this isn't as far away as most people might imagine. Hydrogen powered cars, is this a technology whose time has come or is it some tree huggers H2O dream? That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. So rollerblading is where it's at for some people on a Saturday morning. For motorheads and motorheads in training, it's pylons, low profile tyres, a skid pad and of course the all new Golf GTI. While the base Golf tips in at about 19 grand, to put all of the icing on the cake you'll have to pony up another $10,000. However, given that the GTI has long been regarded as a true driver's car, it's a premium that's not overly difficult justify. The latest version strengthens that point of view. While the suspension is not exactly exotic, featuring McPherson struts up front, a simple torsion beam axle in back and anti-roll bars at both ends, the road manners most certainly are. Simply stated, the GTI handles like the Dickens. The grip is tenacious, roll and understeer benign and the feedback through the steering wheel superb. The finishing touches come in the form of large 205-55R16 tyres and a very stiff chassis. The GTI is offered one of two ways. This screamer of a VR6 or a very boring 4. Now it doesn't take much imagination to pick the right engine. Go with the 6 and you get 174 horsepower and 181 pounds feet of torque. And it's those numbers that's such an integral part of this car's fun. GTI and a 4-banger that pushes 115 horsepower out the door simply does not compute. The VR6, on the other hand, most certainly does. The narrow angle 15 degree V6 is a neat concept as it delivers the smoothness and power of a 6, yet occupies little more space than a 4. 
It also benefits from the use of a single cylinder head that spans both banks. The other major consideration is that it delivers 85% of its power between 2 and 6,000 RPM, putting it in the everyday range. The manual box, while a little rubbery to the feel, uses well-spaced ratios and the clutch is progressive but not quite perfect. As with the last few VWs tested, the bite point is late in the travel which is a pain in stop and go traffic. It also promotes clutch slip on initial takeoff which is a big no-no. You know, the days of dreary black have finally gone and what we have now with the new Golf is a very tastefully attired full leather interior all the materials have a touch and feel of quality, great sounding radio, although there are a few too many buttons, analog gauges, and all the power controls are placed where they logically should be. Now while you do get this very easy to use pump action handle to raise and lower the seat, you've got to wrestle with this knob, which is almost impossible with the door shut. As with the handling characteristics, the brakes are well above average for this class of car. Four-wheel discs with standard anti-lock provide tremendous stopping power and distances of a very short 112 feet from 80k. I also like the pedal feel. The initial pedal movement provides progressive braking. From then on, incremental inputs boost the braking forces exponentially. It's a great system. You know, I can't understand why hatchbacks aren't more popular in North America. They're practical and you can shoehorn a week's worth of stuff in the back with ease. And if it happens to have GTI on the tailgate, well, it tells you that it's got performance, poise, and now panache. But as with its forefathers, this GTI has an issue. And that issue, well, it's called price. Time to update our long-term Honda Odyssey. Now, Honda knew they had to make some improvements over the first-generation van. One, it had to be bigger. Well, they've accomplished that. Second, power, or lack of it. Well, they've also solved that problem. And here's the reason why. A brand new 3.5-liter single overhead cam 24-valve V6. Now, this sucker delivers 210 horsepower, up from the old numbers of 140. But the real figure is in pounds feet of torque. The old one was 145, this one 229, 90% of which is developed at just 2,000 RPM. You can file that under active safety. Here's the reason why you've got a full load you want to pass, you know it's safe out there, and this is where you need low end torque. Hit the accelerator, plenty of power safely back in the safe lane and I take that over an extra airbag any day. We'll have more on the Honda and maybe a pet peeve on a future update. Our Midas tip of the week concerns side marker lamps. Probably the most overlooked lamp on your car next to the license plate light is this side marker lamp. There's a couple of specific situations where this thing can really save your bacon. Imagine for a second you're pulling out of a side street onto a main artery and you're pulling yourself ahead in the steering wheel trying to peer down a row of cars to see if it's safe to pull out. If you stick your nose out a little bit too far, you might get it chopped off. But if this lamp is working properly, it'll alert cars to the fact that you're trying to do that and they might even be able to steer around you even if you made a mistake and stuck it out too far. Another situation is a multi-lane highway. You're trying to make a lane change maybe in the dark or in the rain and if there's a dark colored car like this one up beside you, if that side marker lamp is working, you'll know he's there and you won't turn into him by mistake. Now I can't believe how many cars come through our shop with two, three, or four of these things burned out. And in some cases, the cars have just been certified and even the mechanic that certified it overlooked it. Check them on your car and replace them if necessary. In most cases, you just reach behind the lamp, twist the bulb holder out, and pull the bulb out to change it. The bulbs are under a buck each. Make sure you fix them or replace them if they're gone. That's your Midas tip of the week. When a car company introduces a special edition of a current model, you know things are going well. well such is the case with Saab, as they introduce the limited edition of the 9.3 to be known as the Viggen. 
Well, Viggen means thunderbolt in Swedish, and it's the name of one of the two Swedish jets that uh, the Swedish Air Force has. That was the inspiration from our aircraft heritage. We worked with Tom Walkinshaw Racing Team in England to be a consultant and help us engineer high performance attributes in this car. It has improved horsepower, torque, suspension system, braking system, bolstered seats, everything to make a really high performance special edition Saab for the Saab enthusiast. This year we're up 90% year to date, which is industry best performance. And we have the best array of product we, we have ever had between the 9.5 and the wagon and the Viggen and a high output 9.5 coming this fall. There's nothing on the horizon that says that that momentum will stop. Check this bus out, 275 horsepower that's like any other bus, but any other bus has to be refueled daily. This one can go 400 kilometers and has zero emissions. Now the price tag of this one is about 1.2 million, but then again, there's only a few of them that have been built. But in just a few years, there'll be 25 buses and up to 50 cars on the roads of California. And as we all know, if clean becomes cool in Southern California, it's only a matter of time. All right, now let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, I'm not sure if it has to be cool or hip. It just has to work and be cost effective. Now, I've heard that the state of California is going to mandate the use of zero emission vehicles, so that'll sure help get the ball rolling for guys like Ballard Power Systems uh, and give them a chance to build enough units to break the cost down and make it cost effective. Anyhow, what I want to talk about this week is electric engine cooling fans. Now electric engine cooling fans are virtually a necessity on a front wheel drive car because the majority of front wheel drive cars have transversely mounted engines just like this one, meaning that the engine is turned to face either the right front or left front fender. That means that your pulleys and uh, belt driven accessories are facing the right or left front fender and it's not practical to have a fan over here when your radiator's got to be up in the airstream coming through the grill of the car. So in the case of a front wheel drive car, it's virtually a necessity to have an electric fan like this mounted behind the radiator at the front of the car. Now shut her off. Now the cooling requirements are virtually the same for front wheel drive cars as they are for rear wheel drive vehicles. The fan needs to move air across the radiator through the radiator and the air conditioning condenser in the front of the car in order to cool the engine and cool the interior of the car. But with the electric engine cooling fan, you also have the option of having the fan shut off when it's not required. Now I've put a jumper wire on the sensor that turns on the electric cooling fan in this car. When we turn the key on, go ahead, you're going to see the engine electric cooling fan cut in. Now that's the amount of noise that it produces. You can hear it quite clearly without the engine running. But in most of these front wheel drive cars, you're going to be able to hear that, that fan when it cuts in when you're in stop and go traffic. And it's something that you should be familiar with and listen for and check your temperature gauge occasionally to make sure that in fact it is coming on when it should and that the fan is cooling the engine down. Now shut the key off. Now there's a couple of components involved in this system. Obviously the plastic fan blades right here and the electric motor that drives them right here, the wiring, the sensor over here that turns on the engine cooling fan and a relay as well to turn on that engine cooling fan. Now on, on many cars as well the uh, computer that runs the engine is involved with turning on the relay that turns on the fan. A few other points you should realize about electric engine fans. First of all, if your car has air conditioning, in all likelihood, that fan should turn on when you select air conditioning position because it needs to move air across the air conditioning condenser in order for the air conditioning system to work, regardless of engine temperature. Also, if you don't have air conditioning turned on or your car isn't so equipped, when the coolant temperature reaches approximately 200 degrees Fahrenheit, that electric fan should turn on to cool the engine. And it's difficult to reach 200 degrees Fahrenheit cooling temperature when the ambient temperature is lower, the car is moving through the air. So you won't always hear that fan run. Uh, also on later model cars, there's other components involved in the system. Many cars today have dual cooling fans, a primary and secondary one, and some cars also have resistors in there that can vary the speed of those fans depending on the cooling requirements of the car. Now, if you're about to embark on a trip to a, the southern states or uh, any trip in hot weather climates or a trip in the summertime, this is one thing you should check out. Familiarize yourself with the sound of that fan, when it should run, and verify that it's working properly. If you're trying to troubleshoot a problem with these fans, an auto repair manual in many cases will have a paragraph in the back 
devoted strictly to engine cooling fans. This book has a real good one. We use it all the time for troubleshooting systems like this. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. talk about hydrogen cars, if, if everybody in the world hadn't seen that piece of video of the hydrogen-filled dirigible, the Hindenburg, blowing up, oh, the inhumanity, well, we'd all be driving hydrogen-powered cars today. And I guess the H-bomb wasn't exactly a PR coup either. But we know the technology is there. We've seen that on today's show. Now, currently, the economics and the infrastructure aren't there, but companies like Ford and Shell, well, if they want it to happen, it will happen. The question is, does anybody want it to happen? You see all these yuppies driving around in their sport utes and pickup trucks. Well, do they care about fuel economy? Do they care about emissions? Obviously not. They wouldn't be driving what they're driving. But if not for our generation, what about our kids? Are they going to enjoy trees and grass like we've got out here? Not if we keep using gasoline the way we are. And it's not just North America. Think about China. It's taken us 100 years to get to this level of vehicle density. It's not going to take China that long because they're starting from a much higher level. And there's lots more of them than there is of us. So we're going to run out of gasoline. That's a given. Is it going to be 100 years from now, 50 years from now, 20 years from now? Whenever it happens, we're going to have to have a replacement. And I'm betting that hydrogen is going to be it. As for when, well, my guess is that if you tune into Motoring 2005, I'll be driving a hydrogen-powered car. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, this week we got a chance to have our first look at two of the newest pollution-free vehicles on this planet. Is it all pie in the sky? Well, you know, I don't think it'll have mass appeal in my lifetime, but they're predicting that by the year 2004, there'll be over a quarter of a million clean cars on the highways in North America. And you know what? This is one time I hope they're right and I'm wrong. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. These vehicles here, um, their sole purpose is to go out get dirty and get stuck. I mean, they're, they're what they call their beaters. And basically, it's a farm community and a bunch of farm community people coming down here for a good time. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.